Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem. So Arendt is a profoundly important thinker. She's so useful to us, especially when we're thinking about the evils of totalitarianism. Arendt covered the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem in 1961. She covered the trials for the New Yorker and published a series of essays in the New Yorker on Eichmann in 1963. In the same year, she published a book-length analysis of Eichmann, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. She published a revised version of the book in 1964. Arendt's analysis of Eichmann was, and to some extent still is, extremely controversial. To my mind, the controversy really revolves around questions of political agency and responsibility. Eichmann was on trial in 1961 for his participation in the Holocaust. He was instrumental to the systematic extermination of millions of Jews, as well as other persecuted peoples in Nazi Germany. Throughout her work, Arendt consistently takes issue with the prosecution's portrait of Eichmann as some kind of monster or criminal mastermind. Despite all the efforts of the prosecution, everybody could see that this man was not a monster, but it was difficult indeed not to suspect that he was a clown. It's this characterization of Eichmann as a clown that drew a lot of criticism. One could argue that in portraying Eichmann as a fool, portraying him as a joke, Arendt goes too far. And there is debate about whether her characterization of Eichmann is accurate or not. One of the crucial things for you to recognize as you're reading this book is that Arendt is not persuaded that Eichmann is some kind of criminal mastermind. Arendt asks us, what if Eichmann is not a monster? Eichmann is clearly guilty of committing horrible crimes. But does categorizing him as a monster actually obscure what happened in Nazi Germany. Monsters, by definition, are unusual or atypical creatures. Arendt's concern is, if we categorize Eichmann and his colleagues as monsters, then we might be tempted to understand the horrors of the Holocaust as acts perpetrated by a select number of wicked individuals. Early in her work, Arendt really dwells on the fact that Eichmann seems ordinary. Eichmann affirms, for example, that he had always been a law-abiding citizen. And Arendt seizes on the detail that multiple psychiatrists had apparently found Eichmann to be a normal person. Arendt suggests this is the key to the whole case, but she says no one in the courtroom really seems to seize on this problem. The problem, to her mind, was that a normal person, neither feeble-minded nor indoctrinated nor cynical, could be perfectly incapable of telling right from wrong. So let's think about this. Eichmann was a Nazi. He committed terrible crimes. Yet he feels no guilt. So what explains that? Was he insane? A monster? Arendt argues that this theory is a red herring. It's a distraction. A big problem emerges when we categorize Eichmann as someone abnormal or monstrous. Specifically, this explanation can't be used over and over again to account for mass participation in Nazi programs. What Arendt draws our attention to is the fact that these extraordinary, unprecedented crimes like the Holocaust can't be perpetrated by a few evil people. That in order for them to happen, they require the participation and the support of many, many ordinary people. It's deeply comforting for us to believe that things like Nazi Germany happen because there's some kind of super tyrant like Hitler who forces people to act against their will, against their better judgment. But Arendt argues that's not the way it works. And so the real philosophical and political theoretical question becomes, how do ordinary people commit extraordinary crimes? Or perhaps even more precisely, what explains widespread participation in totalitarian evil? Arendt argues we should not be looking for a psychological profile. We should instead be looking for the political process that makes unthinkable actions possible. She argues that to blame the Holocaust on the moral failures of Nazi leaders is just insufficient. We need to focus on the totalitarian regime that makes it possible for large numbers of otherwise normal people to kill millions of innocents. The regime or political order matters so much because the question of ordinary people committing extraordinary crimes isn't just about one person. It's about many people. Conventional portraits of unjust regimes focus on the extraordinary appetites of a tyrant, or maybe a tyrannical class. Arendt says what's going on in Nazi Germany is something profoundly different. We can trace our understanding of the way that a regime shapes the character of its citizens back to Plato and Aristotle. 
The basic idea is that different regimes produce different characters, or as the ancients might have said, different kinds of souls. So a democracy produces citizens who love freedom, for example. A tyranny produces slaves. The citizens themselves are slaves, but also, ironically, the tyrant is a kind of slave, because he himself is controlled by his own appetites. When we look at the works of Plato or Aristotle, all the way up through Machiavelli and Locke, this is the portrait of political injustice that we get. And traditionally, we think this kind of political evil is motivated by appetites, by, by greed, by fear, by ambition. But according to Arendt, desire and fear do not seem to be the forces driving citizens of totalitarian regimes. Now, Arendt's claim is that Nazi Germany is not a tyranny. Rather, it's a new kind of regime, a totalitarian regime. And to understand totalitarianism, we might think of the factory. The totalitarian regime seems to turn people into machines without will, reason, or freedom. And here we come to the crux of the issue with respect to agency and responsibility. If the totalitarian state reimagines political life as a kind of factory, a series of machines and mechanisms, to what extent do citizens simply become cogs in those machines, unthinking automatons? To what extent does the citizen of a totalitarian regime have political agency. Now, Arendt is occasionally criticized. People sometimes read her as suggesting that Nazis aren't responsible for their actions. And in saying that Eichmann's conscience, his ability to tell right from wrong, does not function in the conventional way, Arendt comes perilously close to saying that we can't hold Eichmann responsible for his actions. But that's not what Arendt believes. This is where the image of the fool becomes extraordinarily important for Arendt. Arendt's claim is that totalitarian regimes produce conditions of thoughtlessness. She claims repeatedly that Eichmann's problem is a thinking problem. She says, for example, that he suffers from an almost total inability ever to look at anything from the other fellow's point of view. Similarly, he was genuinely incapable of uttering a single sentence that was not a cliché. And then, the longer one listened to him, the more obvious it became that his inability to speak was closely connected with an inability to think. Arendt's claim in this work is going to be that Eichmann's key problem is that he stopped thinking. He essentially abdicated his rational capacity. Arendt sees this as characteristic of citizens living within a totalitarian regime. Totalitarian regimes seem to specialize in preventing rational thought, in subverting it, and confusing it. From Arendt's perspective, they quite literally become an inhuman regime. The moment when a person, when a citizen, abdicates the reason and opts not to think, that is a moment of great moral failure. Reading Hannah Arendt reminds us to be vigilant. We need to pay attention to laws, policies, programs, technologies that reduce or limit our agency, our political will. Anything that seeks to subvert or diminish our capacity for political decision-making is dangerous. That's all for now, everyone. As always, thanks very much for watching.